Good afternoon, good evening everybody, and welcome to the 64th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Um, we are recording this meeting, so anybody who does not wish to be recorded should be now. Uh, I'm very pleased and happy to welcome uh, as our speaker today, Christoph Auer, who is the lead for professional education at the European Institute of Technology's Climate um, Knowledge Innovation Community, or Climate Kit. Um, many of us have been working with uh, Christoph in one way or another uh, for the last 18 months, nearly two years. Uh, and so we're delighted uh, this, this evening today to have the opportunity to uh, hear from Christoph. And I think he's going to lead us through an interesting conversation from the, the European and climate perspective on business models. So, uh, and we have Simon Robinson just joining us from Brazil. Uh, welcome, Simon. So, Christoph, uh, over to you. And uh, folks, uh, if you want to put questions to Christoph in the chat or interrupt, uh, Christoph can tell us how you would like to, to handle that. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present to, to the uh, sustain, Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Um, yeah, uh, as Anthony mentioned, I work for Climate Kick, which is the largest European public-private um, partnership um, addressing climate change, especially through innovation. And um, yeah, myself, I am um, have a background in management and I was trained in a traditional kind of business school with traditional business approaches at that time. Actually, it's not that long ago. I graduated eight years ago. And um, yeah, but so still, um, yeah, was, yeah, growing in my educational graduate career with this kind of uh, traditional approaches. And, but very soon, actually, I started questioning uh, if some of those concepts we were having actually are fit for the future. And um, one of my first projects I was doing in my professional career is uh, a strategic analysis about climate change and an impact on a large industrial site on, uh, in Frankfurt, uh, in Germany. And um, while interacting with this industrial park um, and some researchers around that, um, I think it became quite evident that um, some changes need to be happen um, to actually drive business sustainably, uh, also in its financial terms, but also to provide a positive contribution to the society and as such. So um, I actually uh, did some research following that on business model, business model innovation, especially in the utility sector, and had the privilege actually to be able to apply this directly in practice at that time and at this industrial park, doing some projects around business model design uh, for utilities and sustainability aspects in the utility sector, uh, in especially into B2B services. And um, yeah, from that actually I was somehow um, affected by the topic of business models and business design. And um, while joining at Climate Geek already at the time, Climate Geek was starting very small, so it was kind of a hobby. Um, we were talking already to many kind of stakeholders. We were starting to educate startups and to train startups and graduate students and, and, and PhDs and so on. I will tell a bit later about more about that. And we were still using traditional approaches. So when we were talking to our startups, we were using the business model canvas and we we're using financial driven models. And actually I was asking myself, is that actually what we should do as an organization trying to decarbonize the society and driving businesses for a low carbon economy. And um, so I think in, in that kind of period, we, we were exploring what actually could be new approaches and um, through colleagues and, um, and coaches we're working with, there was the connection made to Anthony and, the, and this group. And I'm very grateful actually for this kind of interaction and for the experiments we were able to do and kind of the activities that we could do together. and. Um, yeah, I would like to share with you today actually what our intention is uh, on the application side of such approaches, um, especially in the educational context, and what we learned from that, um, what, what failures we had, um, what we think could be strategies actually for the future, 
to actually make this mainstream um, and to um, yeah and both on the educational side but also in a movement side um, and so with my intention for today is to make this very interactive um, I try to switch to the next slide but it doesn't work I don't know ah here okay so this, uh, the discussion points for today, um, very quickly, and that's why it's a different color, um, I would like to introduce what Climate Kick is and why we think at Climate Kick that uh, strongly sustainable business model approaches matter. So this is um, probably the most boring part of, of this presentation, um, but I think it's important just to understand the context from which we are coming and how we're trying to address those. And all the other things are mainly um, reflections on the experiences we made in applying such approaches in our programs and working with different kind of organizations. And um, so I would like to invite you to contribute to this discussion. So um, at any time, raise questions, comment on some of the statements and hypotheses that you will be hearing from my side and uh, question or doubt some of those things. Um, and yes, yeah, so I hope we will have an interactive dialogue about those things. So first kind of discussion point would be about the challenge. What is it really, the ch what is the challenge about in applying and scaling the use of uh, strongly sustainable business uh, model approaches and practice? Uh, secondly, about what are the barriers? And why is it actually so tough to making this a mainstream uh, kind of movement or mainstream uh, kind of um, methodology or approach and uh, last but not least what are the pathways to make that happen what ideas and strategies are there and to accelerate the use in of such approaches and practice so um yeah to start with uh, what is climate kick and why do we think uh, this business strongly sustainable business model approaches do matter actually for us um, so we were created by one of the European Union's agencies, the EIT, it's the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, a very new uh, kind of institution, just eight or nine years old. And it's actually an experiment within Europe, trying to bring in a large amount of public funding, bringing together actors from academia, the business side, but also the public side, so authorities and governments to collaborate and drive innovation linked to one of the grand challenges. So um, our challenge that we're trying to tackle is uh, climate change. And um, there are other similar organizations that work on energy, on food, on digitalization, on healthcare, for example. Um, and our role is actually to think about how can we drive the innovative or innovation capacity of Europe to tackle climate change. And uh, the way we do is actually we have different kind of programs. Um, one is our startup program. It's one of the biggest one where we actually work with entrepreneurs um, that have uh, clean tech solutions, for example, or clean tech ideas and try to accelerate them. But then we also have a large portfolio of different projects where we directly engage with the partners um, on developing new projects, new technologies, but also new processes and services. And this is clustered in different themes. You can see them on the, on the slides. The biggest one is uh, urban transitions, which is mainly about integrated services and mobility, um, um, energy, um, and so on in cities. Um, and sustainable production system is another one, which is about the, the kind of circular economy, things and like that. Underpinning all of this is education, and that's the area that I'm working for. So we are trying to do capacity building for both the larger society, from master students to PhD students and to professionals, um, but also for our own ecosystems. So we're trying to train our partners, our staff, and all um, people to, to, in these capacities and competences we think are important to drive climate action. We actually are operating in 18 locations in Europe, so most of the EU member states actually, um, and even one non-EU member state, or not really, it's a, Switzerland is also not one, but um, Serbia, which is a, a potential can, or candidate for becoming a member. 
And we work with 190 partners, 190 institutions, uh, of which roughly 50% are businesses. And the rest is equally split between academia and uh, public or not-for-profit kind of um, um, institutions. Um, how do we do education? Because um, that's also one of the things that we're trying to do, work with our university partners is, we think that a lot of the, the competences that are required cannot be translated through traditional kind of knowledge-driven, expert-driven education. So we're, tr we're trying to look at it from the, from, the, from the challenge. So what kind of challenge is out there? What challenges do practitioners face? What are the competences that are required to tackle those? How can we link to them? Um, and so we can make kind of a modular program to be able to link to different audiences at any time. And you will later see in, in some of my hypotheses that I think that this is very essential also for scaling the uh, application of uh, strongly sustainable business model approaches. And the way we try to do the learning is action-based. So the knowledge dissemination, the content we're trying to do mainly through e-learning and very limited through um, yeah, face-to-face -face interactions. We're using the time when people meet actually to apply the content to the challenges that people face. And also what we try to do is to follow up after a kind of a learning interaction so that people actually can train and get kind of coaching around the application. And um, yeah, so very quickly, that's the way how we do it. So we do professional coaching and we try to offer blended formats, learning by doing, I mentioned this already, by using cutting edge tools and concepts in the various areas but also using the experiences and best practice of the people, because when, especially in professional education, the audience is so rich of experience and uh, competencies and sh the platform of a course just to, to enable the sharing of this knowledge and the experience between those people is very enriching. And of course, we help people to address their own challenges and um, actually work with their own cases so that they're actually the transfer of the learning to the workspace so to say is guaranteed or at least um we'll try to increase the likelihood for that so um very very important maybe also for a discussion at the end is what do we actually do at climate kick centrally because what we don't do is actually running a lot of activities ourselves because that's not how we can create impact um, if we want to reach tens of thousands of people in the long term, um, we rely on multipliers, um, partners, coaches, experts that are able to do that, that are able to translate some of the approaches and methodologies into different languages um, in Europe. So what we do mainly, the focus in Climate League is we're trying to create the resources and the assets that are actually required to do that. This is the pedagogies, how, what the learning approaches, it's about the competencies and the standards, and it's the learning materials and tools required and the people actually are able to do that, put this into practice. So, uh, but still also we have a portfolio of activities and courses that we run ourselves and um, with around five to 600 people per year going through those courses. And um, the, the main purpose of those is actually for us to, to create references for some of these things and to also to test and experiment with new approaches in practice. And so we can learn from that and actually adapt this and, and fine tune and improve the kind of learning offers and services we have. We also have a certification accreditation unit, but this is independent, so from that. Yes, also, we've, we've had some successes in the past. Um, we're very proud, especially of our gender parity. And so on all of our programs, we have a kind of a 50-50 um, um, participation of actually male and female people. Um, also in our entrepreneurship programs. And uh, also there were some of our alumni have achieved very high recognition in, in, in different kind of areas. And um, so that's also nice to see for us, of course, that there's some impact um, that we create with our courses. So um, just now trying to bridge to the, to the business model discussion. So in this context that I just presented, and our mission is to drive innovation to, for low carbon innovation based on the hypothesis that we need a transition of the economic model towards a low carbon economy. 
And this means basically um, we need different and new tools and methods actually to do business and to train especially young businesses also how to set up their business based on kind of new tools. And um, this probably is a kind of quotation that you know because it's, uh, um, I think, so uh, very often it's quite also common sense that probably all of you that have actually interacted with business have experienced that. Many people say, yes, you are absolutely right. We understand this challenge. We need to change all these kind of things. But when it comes to the implementation, um, there's a big gap. And um, so that's also one of the things we want to address. And I think um, we need definitely new approaches to be able to do that. Um, because with the kind of standard old um, commercial oriented customer center kind of perspectives, this transition will not be happening. Um, so that's one of the things why we think it's important, but also we think that the business model topic as such has a strategic relevance and has the potential to actually accelerate um, this transition from many perspectives. So the way we are intending to use it and already are using goes beyond the very narrow definition of business model. So we're trying to apply this also with city authorities and we're trying to do this also with NGOs, for example. And the reasons for that is um, it's mainstream as such, the topic of business modeling. Many people know it, understand it. It's part of many discourses. And um, it's future oriented. So usually the way you use it is trying to think what you can do in the future, how, uh, what you want to achieve in the future. So that's, that's very important, of course, also for, for, for the work we're doing. Uh, creating value is core um, of any initiative, project, business, and that's also the core of a business model. And therefore, a lot of projects, uh, not-for-profit not for endeavors, also NGO initiatives, uh, can work with such a process if you are looking at the value perspective. And now the aspect of sustainability is even more uh, important, emphasizes this, because one of the, exp the uh, ex experiences we made is when working with single institutions that actually, for them, it's very challenging to think about how they can break down action to themselves as a single entity. A lot of the, the, the scientific concepts also um, emerging in Europe around transitions, thinking, changes, um, are very strong on the macro level. So it's very difficult for individual institutions to say, how can I contribute to it? How I can contribute to such a transition of an economic system, for example. But business modeling or sustainable business modeling can provide a kind of an anchor for that. Um, it integrates also many facets and methods. And actually it can integrate different kind of tools and methods and schools and so on. And that's, I will talk about this later when, we, when, we, when we, I want to talk about the contextualization challenge. But um, that's also one of the things that, that that's a flexible approach, an easy process that you can relate around it and you can link different kind of tools and methods into this kind of a business model narrative. And um, yeah, also that's part of um, the discourse and how the discourse becomes mainstream already. Um, we did some expert interviews a couple of years ago and actually I think it was around 30 or 35 interviews with mainly large corporates and all of them confirmed um, that this topic of sustainable business modeling will be one of the most important capacities for their future success. And the intention from their perspective was mainly because they didn't understand actually uh, what strategic impact sustainability as such will have on their business model. So it was not about, not, not from the aspect that we need, not, or not only from the aspect that we need a new kind of economic system or kind of um, um, paradigms, but also from, from their perspective that they actually were afraid of not knowing what will be happening to their business model. And uh, from the educational perspective, if you master successfully sustainable business modeling and the implementation part of it, you will have their essential competencies for future success, as we think. And therefore, also from just an educational perspective, it's a perfect start for many things because you can relate to many of the competencies that we think are essential. So um, just the, on that, 
in a nutshell, I'm just saying there was a new, was there a new chat? So was there a question, are you currently running any courses related to creating sustainable business model? Uh, yes, um, actually a lot. Um, we work with a lot of startups on the one hand, very young startups, but we also have one program which is called the Greenhouse. This is a pre-incubation program, mainly with students. So we have a, a, um, a kind of a summer school program where we ask students to come up with a virtual business model after five weeks. And many of those actually then go into a pre-incubation program where we then start working with them on defining uh, um, sustainable business models and also helping them to prototype, for example, and to make the next step towards creating a company. So this is an example. Um, yeah, so the, the following statements now that, uh, about the, what, what we think, how it can work and what we experience in applying those things are actually, it's not based on research. Yeah, so it's based on our uh, experiences um, and we applied this in the past with around 500 professionals in trainings and courses, 70 startups. Uh, around 50 professional coaches and a few hundred masters and PhD students. I don't know exactly how many, but also one of the challenges I can already bring up here, this is only a fraction of the people that we work with every year. So also here you can see that all, not in all of our activities and program, this kind of strongly sustainable business model approaches are implemented and embedded. And uh, I will talk about this later, why this is so. And there, it's not only a question of how you actually convince people to apply this. It's also a lot of about in institutional settings. And that's what we experience in our own organization every day. Um, okay, so now the hopefully interactive part will start. Um, so very quickly, the first thing about the challenge is probably very, very, very short. What is actually the challenge um, really about applying and scaling um, SSBM approaches in practice? And uh, one of the, what is the nature of such approaches? So first of all, we have new tools and we have new methods um, that we will use. We have usually multi-dimensional decisions um, because we include different kind of yeah, objective lines, um, social, um, economic, and environmental profits, so to say. And we have paradigm shifts um, included as well um, compared to the traditional kind of economic models that we are using. Um, so in a nutshell, it's about convincing users about the value of many simultaneous changes. And that's quite one of the challenges, um, quite a big challenge, because if it's only one challenge or one thing that, uh, that changes, um, that can be already challenging enough, but here we usually come along with many challenges at the same time. Um, but there's another kind of element of the challenge, and that's the user perspective. So user that want to work with, with us on using such approaches have usually a one-dimensional problem setting or interest in it. And um, it's very specific. It could be, for example, that they say, actually, I want to know much more about how I can make my business more sustainable. Or another kind of challenge they ask, well, actually, I don't know what sustainability and the kind of sustainability movement means for my business model or I don't know what the, the kind of legislation will be look like. So people that you work with in startups or established business usually have a very one dimensional interest. So that's also part of the challenge is also aligning the supply side intentions about changing um, the kind of approaches and models to work with, with a demand side interest. So it's a lot of a translation communication action as well. So I think that's very simply put, the, what, how I would frame this kind of challenge. And my question for you would be, do you see this similarly or would you see this kind of challenge completely differently? Um, any ideas or comments? Uh, 
that I can't. Really no, I'm wrong, though. I think Stephen has it. Well, I, I think you've got your finger on um, what I consider to be uh, one of the critical questions around inclusive collaborative design. Um, because when it comes to looking at a group of stakeholders, uh, typically, if, if I'm interpreting what you mean by one dimensional problem setting correctly, Christoph, um, usually someone who is in a position of privilege or has a position of power is the one who gets to uh, set the context for the problem or to do the problem setting or to define the interests, the primary interests. Mm. So the challenge then is how do we broker a meaningful dialogue amongst a broader group of stakeholders on all of the interests for the on all of the stakeholder groups and interests in that, that they have in seeing an enterprise flourish. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I have a thought, but I'll let other people go first if anybody else would like to uh, respond to Christoph's question. Yeah, it's uh, Nabil here. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to, to just uh, uh, submit that uh, in some of the research we have done, and we mostly focus on small and medium enterprise, uh, the, the challenge uh, at the layer even before that is that, you know, the use of modeling tools altogether, never mind sustainable models, you know, is, is not really as strong as people assume. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a study on, on some of the small medium enterprise in Quebec and in Ontario. And from the sample that we uh, uh, interviewed, actually uh, almost none of them used those uh, uh, tools and so on. So if you look at the uh, larger enterprises and at the upper layer of the small medium, so the, the upper medium enterprises, yes, uh, you know, they, they know about that. Some of them use that, etc. cetera. Uh, but um, a lot of the others are not actually uh, aware or aware but not using those tools. Um, and when we looked at some of the reasons for that, um, it turns out that it is related to how you do strategy in those organizations. So we had somehow, you know, in our developments uh, assumed implicitly that the um, business model tool is used at the strategy articulation point. But when we looked at how small, medium uh, enterprise do uh, strategy, it turns out that they actually the, the, the business model tool is used downstream of that. So first, the uh, strategy is articulated in the C-suite or uh, management is pushed down, and then they use these, uh, uh, you know, models, if at all, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, so uh, you know, I, I'd like to say maybe the challenge is, is even larger than that because, uh, you know, uh, just in the areas or in the group of uh, consultants and, and uh, active people in that space, uh, we make a lot of assumptions. I mean, we think that the um, uh, Osterwalder, uh, 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 you know, canvas is so universal and so well known. And actually, in that sample that we took, they didn't even know about the, the Osterwalder canvas, which was stunning. Uh, you know, uh, when because we assume like almost everybody would know about <laughs> it. And so, uh, I think there is need to take um, a step back and, and look carefully at where the business model, uh, uh, the tool comes in relation to strategy articulation, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the small and medium enterprise. Yes, I definitely agree. Um, and um, also later I probably will touch a little bit on this and talk about the context um, and the different kind of perspectives uh, and maybe even level of awareness actually, how to think about sustainability in business models and depending also on which phase you are, if it's a design stage or an analytical phase, or if it's the implementation actually of a, of a design business model. So, so I, I would like to uh, strongly support the Bill's uh, statements. Uh, this is very much our practical experience as well, um, having run workshops and labs for over 1,500 people in 12 countries over the last two and a half years. Um, I would say it's a tiny, major, a tiny number of the people in those labs uh, know of uh, Osterwalder's canvas, even less have actually used it. Um, and um, we're, we're having to start from scratch. So I, I think there's a, 
in, 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 in addition to people tend to come to it late in the, in the strategy to operationalization cycle, um, there's also a basic lack of awareness. Um, and I, I think I will add to this, there's the completely normal challenge that most small businesses, small medium businesses have, which of course is the vast majority of all businesses, 98, 99% here in Ontario as an example, are small and medium, um, that they simply don't have the capacity to really do strategy work. Um, you know, it's, it's far too much focused on uh, essentially survival. Um, and uh, we've done a, a little bit of work now, uh, particularly because of the succession issue that's now going on in small and medium businesses, um, where of course the value of the business is now completely locked up in the founder or a very small number of people around the founder who are all working crazy hours. They want to retire, they want to sell the business, but of course they can't because they're all busy fighting the fires that keep the business afloat. And so the solution to this obviously would be for them to think about what their business model is, convey that to a potential seller, but they simply just don't have the time. There's some hygiene, some, some good management practices that they need to put in place and some professionalization of management that small and medium businesses um, generally, or I wouldn't say generally is too strong, often don't have. And so the capacity for thinking about strategy is almost a luxury that they don't Yes. Yes, I think I remember for one of the courses I used a slide always where where you're saying okay, actually um, for most of the companies uh, doing business is a matter of surviving, um, and it's part of the, our competitive system. And I think eighty percent of the companies uh, actually don't uh, um, experience their twentieth anniversary. Yeah, so that's that's it's all linked to this kind of debate. Yeah, or perspective. Are there the resources that the time actually to think about these strategies and um, um, or is it a battle for survival every day and fixing quick things? Okay, and any other ideas about that? Oh, what? Randy, I'm curious for your work in the in, in the area of program design in slightly larger organizations. Um, one of the other things that differentiates the business modeling approach is it tends to be more design orientated rather than analytically orientated. I'm wondering if you've seen what sort of interest or awareness even have you seen in design-based approaches in the larger organizations that you've been working with? Yeah, I don't know if I have enough of a sort of critical mass of, of experience to really convey anything that is um, statistically relevant but I mean I would say in general I don't I don't know that the practice you know taking taking an, intel an intelligent and informed approach to design or even considering design as a component of, of strategy is, is commonplace in in business and in organizations um, if it is it's probably you know one person who happens to to feel like it's a, a valuable technique that brings it into the fold amongst leaders but I mean as a as a management approach or uh, a method for resolving issues, for figuring out how to establish a path forward, for rethinking uh, the organization itself. Yeah, it, it, it's never really uh, occurred for me as, as, as something that's commonly used or, or even uh, some, as has been mentioned, um, even commonly acknowledged as, as a tool that's available. So, so we, have a, we have a powerful approach that people are unaware of, uh, have no time to apply, mm -hmm. and don't understand the fundamental, uh, I don't know what's the right word, ethos of the approach required to, to use it. That, is that a summary of our conversation so far? Yeah, could be. And I think it links to probably the next part, which is the, the, the barriers Yeah, for, for that as well. Because, um, you already mentioned some of those, like probably the lack of time um, and and the not knowing or not understanding the, the background of these kind of things. Um, 
So maybe we could just continue then on, on, on that question. So why is it so difficult to make this mainstream? And um, so just also again from base, the reflection based on the experience we made so far, um, the first barrier and probably the, the biggest one um, in, so I'm not talking about the way actually how to try to find people doing it, but when we work with those people. And this is also where most of our failures actually lie uh, in the past about this thing is, it's really the complexity. Um, the approaches are much more complicated than the traditional approaches. We, you work with more perspectives, more stakeholders, you work with more dimensions. Um, and therefore we have a kind of a multiplying effect on that. Much more hypothesis, much more validation and, and these kind of things that will be is required. So, so and, Christoph, on that first point, do you feel, um, I, I mean, it, it seems to me that the, there's been an oversimplification in existing business approaches, mm -hmm. what's led us into this mess. And so um, th there has to be some increase in the complexity Yes. Otherwise, we'll be continuing to create the situations that we've already been creating. But for you, when you're making these statements on complexity, is that what you're referring to? Or are you saying that you think there's a, that we have not got yet to the um, necessary level of complexity, that we've over, we're still overcomplicated or overcomplex? Again, yes. what, is necess what, what the necessary increase is. I, I would say simply the appetite for additional complexity that we will. Right. People, people, most people are already in a stance of bewilderment and, and lostness around complexity. The moment you introduce a new technique that is more complex, it requires more cognitive overhead, but they just kind of go, but yeah. That totally reminds me of it. Typical, you know, the classic example of what winner is using. <laughs> yes, I think you're wrong. Uh, I think that's a very valid point. It seems like I'm going to mute you. I, I, uh, if it's, we, we can hear your, uh, uh, you know, the young person in the background there, which is lovely to hear that on the call, but that strong sustainable business models. Uh, but we're going to mute you. And uh, Sima, I don't think uh, you've joined us before, so I'd love you to put in the chat your name and affiliation for the, uh, for the minutes. Sorry, uh, Panos, you were to say. So, yeah, I'd say there's a glass example that I've heard Bob uh, we heard mentioned a couple of times. So, uh, back in his IBM days, when they were trying to introduce Peter Shanks by you know, his discipline work and all that, and they were working on this idea for months, and then they went to the CEO and said, We have this nice model about it, and he said, like, Forget about it. My managers have like so many IBM models already, you know, they're not loading this, you know, too. So basically, they went back, renamed everything, came back to him and said, Oh, yeah, this is exactly what we want. But, you know, they were talking in the IBM lingo now. So maybe that's a way of, you know, step, you know, maybe a step approach. Like, <laughs> speaking their language. And I, and I guess this is like the gist of what all this, you know, uh, you know uh, basically saying. One of the main methods is like, meet them where they are. So maybe, I guess from a consultant point of view, maybe you can retain all this complexity and translate it or feed it like gradually to the client or to the company, while also on your, you know, on your side, you retain the complexity and maybe you control the process. But of course, that is, you know, it's an art, I guess, <laughs> it's an art. So I don't know how it, uh, so I, I will try to, later on in the in the in the, in the next part to, to think about what could be strategies to work with this. But also from just from the experience, um, I think that's just people are used to having more or less smooth tools and processes and checklists to work with um, that links directly to their challenges. And uh, for example, last week we did a, again a, a, a session with startups, um, and we were. In two hours only, it was part of a bigger workshop to think about sustainability aspects of their business models. And there we were really 
trying to provide them with kind of checklist oriented um, worksheets so that they could think about the different dimensions going through checklists. But still then, um, it seemed to be um, so complex for them to, to think about this and that at the end, the, anal the analysis they were doing was very, very superficial. Yeah, so I think it's part of the uh, expectation management and, and, and communication around these kind of things. And I, I, I personally agree that the level of complexity needs to increase um, to be able to tackle those. But um, people need to see the value in that as well, so which we'll, I will come back to that later. The second point linked to complexity, very difficult to find the right starting point. It's always from where do you start when talking about uh, sustainable business models? Is it the paradigms? Is it the values? Um, is it the, the value co-creation, co-destruction? Is it the design? Is it the analysis? How is it linked? So it's and really depending on, on, on the target group. Most of the people, because they have this kind of one-dimensional, let's say, problem or perceived problem, um, they expect something that they very quickly see that the tangible value linked to the kind of problems they are seeing. And that's why it's sometimes very difficult to, for, for, to start with, some, to find the right starting point. And actually, that's, um, I mentioned at the beginning, this institutional kind of barriers. Um, that's one of the, this complexity is the main reason internally in Climate Kick why there's still people saying, oh, we're, I'm not so sure if we actually should apply such approaches uh, throughout all of our programs and to all of our uh, startup uh, programs and things like that we're doing. Because um, one of the main arguments I hear often is those people that we work with are so at the beginning and they have so much different fundamental needs than just thinking about this. They need to sort out their business strategy first or idea before they actually are able to think about these kind of things. So, and that's why, um, yeah, I think there's this complexity topic uh, in general is, um, is, is really a, a huge barrier. Um, and um, but there are opportunities to, to work around this, uh, I think, and um, I will share some of those ideas. Um, Simon Robinson has been putting uh, quite a lot of comments in the chat. Simon, do you, do you want to say anything out loud? Um, you, you've been saying you're saying yeah. in, in Brazil. Yeah, sorry, um, I've just taken, I'm not having the video on. We've got a few kind of um, internet challenges right now. Um, it's, it's just really interesting. Um, especially talking about complexity. I don't know if you saw, we, we, um, we put um, subtitles on a recent VUCA um, video. And it, it's really been interesting. We're taking a, uh, we've been asked in one project, um, a very major national company, uh, the largest renewable energy company in Brazil. You know, we've been doing an awful lot of dialogue sessions because it's, in terms of some of the complexity, you know, there's the classic problem of working in silos, not enough cross-departmental um, conversations, firefighting, you know, the, the very kind of typical things. And also, as I mentioned, in Brazil, there is a kind of more cultural norm, which for, you know, for interesting reasons, is very much focused on the short term. So we've been doing some very interestingly structured dialogue sessions to really help people come together and rethink, you know, their strategic planning process and also um, their, you know, their business process design. Uh, they, they, they're moving from like um, being five years old, they're now looking forward. But also the other, so I'll try to say this really quickly, just um, the other challenge is the introduction of, in Brazil of many um, Chinese companies and they have a much longer term. So you have these kind of cross-cultural issues as well, which is, you know, it's interesting. It's a very interesting business challenge. Yeah, so you see the, the list gets even longer <laughs> Yeah, around the complexity. And also the, the other final thing is it was interesting that you'll talk about, well, where's the starting point? I did have a question, and that was around the notion of the value proposition. Mm -hmm. Because some of the um, some of the other work we've been doing with the um, flourishing canvas has been more based around the social sustainability issues. I know here we're talking about climate change, 
but really looking at the value proposition, how to engage customers, the whole customer experience. That for us, um, people have found the, the flourishing business canvas hugely interesting mm. uh, when you start the conversation there and then you expand out to the other more, say, traditional um, or maybe we could say um, ecological aspects of the business model. Yes. Also, also that's um, from the experience that we, we made with some of the programs with the flourishing business canvas, for example, is uh, similar to what you just mentioned. Uh, on the and the analytical part already, uh, um, in as part of the design stage, when you 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 see so many different opportunities and risks um, that people find very interesting to work with, and that's one of the quick values that you can easily communicate. So I will try to come back to that later. Um, part of the stories that you can tell the communication around the value of such approaches and um, yeah I agree so that's that's one of the the, the quick or low quick fix or low-hanging fruits and um, in, in the communication around it from our experience and you can do a very simple exercises with hypothetical cases and get people convinced for example we one of the programs we did this, um, we would try to do a, such an analytical exercise with the flourishing business canvas using McDonald's and um, uh, in maybe a one hour exercise and people were just really inspired about how many things they thought they found out about McDonald's and about the business model, the risk and opportunities that is um, probably McDonald's know because they have a large um, strategy department and sustainability department, but um, for people usually are not not so clear yeah so it's yeah i mean it's really interesting just to also link in what anthony was saying about people not necessarily being familiar with the business model canvas yeah. we actually use coca-cola just as a really simple business that everyone knows to introduce the business model canvas before then expanding out to the flourishing business canvas and it was just fascinating. Maria and I were presenting at the event, Sustainable Brands, Buenos Aires, last month. And Coca-Cola were there presenting. And Greenpeace, two, peace, two uh, protesters from Greenpeace, peacefully got up onto the stage. Because um, here in Brazil, um, Coca-Cola are doing some very important social projects around education to really help improve the educational um, standards here, which is great. But on the other hand, the, in Argentina, there's problems with deforestation, which is what the protest was about. Mm. And it's just really interesting showing, Maria presented Flourishing Canvas, and he's this example last week in a major, major company. And then she, she talked about the fact that, well, unless you're authentic, you know, it's, it's, it's not that... You know, it's not a terrible thing to say, look, we're really doing our best, but we know we've still got things to improve. Mm. The, the person presenting from Coca-Cola just didn't have an answer mm. to the Green Priest protest. You know, he kind of, it was a little bit like a rabbit caught in the headlights. There was no authentic answer there. So it, it's just really interesting how you, you know, really talk around these, you know, the, go from the expansion from the business model canvas to the flourishing canvas that there's some really engaging ways, as you mentioned, you know, people do really get it very quickly if you're a little bit creative on how to, how you explain things. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just moving on. So, um, to some, there are some more barriers. I think are there. So it's the second one we already touched on it. It's actually to experience the value of strong system business model approaches. Um, it's for some it's really difficult to to see or to to, to get, actually I, would, I want some evidence. Can you provide me with something that I can relate to? And there are still comparatively few examples and cases existing, um, or it's actually difficult to relate to the existing ones. So there are some cases from startups and um, from kind of niche um, kind of um, industries and so on. But um, for some of the people, it's really difficult. Yeah, it's a nice example, and I understand the example, but actually, I can't translate this into my context. So that's, that's what many people experience. And um, So Christoph, I wanted to ask Simon uh, this question. So we, 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 we have a, we've been struggling to find cases for exactly this reason. Um, and you said that everybody knows the Coca-Cola business model. 
But the Coca-Cola business model, which is all about globally uh, licensing the right to make syrup and to use that syrup in the local bottling operations, um, is actually not the business model that most people understand at all. They think it's all about the retail sale, manufacturing retail sale of, um, of uh, fizzy drinks. So are, are you talking about the sort of retail view of that or are you talking about their underlying business model? I'm just, I'm just curious because I mean, we've been using Nespresso recently in a lot of our workshops and regularly run into rooms that don't know what Nespresso is. And they, uh, so I, I, I certainly have experienced this exact problem, but I haven't come up with an answer yet. So Simon, I'm interested in to see your perspective. You're on mute, Simon. Hi, is that, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, um, I was kind of rushing my words. We talk about syrup and we talk about the distribution. I think really because it's not a complicated business oh. model. Yeah, so we use that example and people can immediately understand, okay, Coca-Cola, they have a um, recipe and blah, blah, blah. They have a syrup. And who are the clients? It's not so much the end customer. It's shops, retailers, restaurants. So we use the more, that example just as something that people can readily relate to. You know, it's not IT, for example, where maybe some people might not really understand it. Do you, is, is it possible for you to share the uh, Coca-Cola one? Uh, there's a couple of people in the chat who have been asking. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll send the slide over. Uh, maybe just post it to the LinkedIn group? Yeah, no problem at all. Brilliant. Thank you. I think also Rodrigo asked if, there, if the McDonald's example is online, and, um, and I, it's not online. Uh, we used it as one as part of our program. It's called Pioneers, but um, um, I'm happy to share the exercise, the assignment, um, if, if, if you're interested. Um, that would be great, Christopher. Um, either feel free to post it somewhere and, and share a link via the LinkedIn group, or you can send it to me and I'll post it in our Google Drive and, and share the link that way. Okay. Yeah, so um, a lot of this barrier will be coming later to what our potential strategies and to overcome those um, are also linked to communication. Yeah, and um, so the experiencing the value to understanding what the value is of such an approach um, and um, yeah, to, um, that's, that's a lot of, about communication, but also there is some work to do. I think um, still... Uh, on the conceptual level of something because or at least what's perceived is that people see that, that there's a certain gap on the implementation side. So there are the tools also where they're very work very well for the design part but um, actually if I have designed such a thing how can I implement this and um, there are initiatives and I think also the um, the Future Fit Business Benchmark provides KPIs or they're not called KPIs, but actually measures um, that should help get going through the implementation process. But for many people still, um, at least they perceive that actually, yeah, it's nice to talk about this, to make some plans, but actually how to put this into practice. So that's also a lot of arguments that, that we've heard. So um, context, uh, this, the, the next barrier. Um, and from the perspective and the experience, I think that the, this successful implementation of a, a strongly sustainable business model approach much more depends on the user group and the user challenge and the user, user perspective much more than it is for traditional approaches. And therefore, generic approaches often fail. User group, the target group, or startup, existing business, SME, large corporate, the challenge that they're having, is it a business model innovation? Is it designing of new one? Is it implementing and monitoring? And the perspective that they're having, the kind of values they bring in, the kind of um, priorities and they bring in, that really, that all matters. And um, the problem about that, if on the one hand, the context matters so much, is one of the barrier because it's so difficult to really, sometimes at least, to provide the, the specific uh, solution for this context because it requires actually highly experienced and trained coaches with a lot of experience and um, and that's a big capacity issue so um, 
we've we've worked with a, a big network of coaches in in Europe and um, and in that big network, I would say there are not many people that actually are able to do that. So, and if you want to scale and multiply, um, you, there there's a need for those people that are actually able to do that. And that's yeah, at least we face this capacity issue. Christoph, um, would you say that it's easier to take somebody who already has the required uh, business knowledge and knowledge of the environmental and social space and teach them how to be business modelers, business designers? Or is it easier to take somebody who has the business modeling, business design experience and give them the, uh, the, uh, the business modeling and business experience and give them the requisite um, uh, uh, sustainability related? I, I'm just noting, for example, that uh, Tim Clark has just published uh, a new book, um, Business Models Business Models for Teams. I'm not quite getting that title right. right. And, you know, he's talking about tens of thousands of people in, in the network now who know how to business model and who obviously therefore have good business knowledge, but are obviously almost entirely unaware of the sustainability side of things. And I'm just wondering if to remove this barrier, would it be possible to go to that group and try to cross-train them in the sustainability issues? But what's been your experience, Christoph? I would say it's none of both. Because <laughs> <laughs> a bit challenging here. No, I, I think it's. Um, I think that, that if if you think about this, I think it depends on the individuals really. But um. I think what is required are people that understand the different contexts and they understand the different kind of uh, solution tools perspectives and they're able to match between those. And that's, uh, it's a kind of a different quality compared to a traditional coach who actually knows how to business model or knows how to sustainable business model. But um, it's a, a matchmaking competence um, which is required. So understanding the different perspectives, the the, um, the, the needs, the, being able to really think of from the customer or user perspective, and at the same time knowing what different kind of tools are available, um, methods in, in different kind of situations. And, um, and I think that's, 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 that's key in, in most cases. Um, sorry, Stephen, go ahead. I, I, I come at this, um, I come at this from a, maybe a little bit a more functional standpoint. Like, why do you build a model in the first place? And if you're building, if you're building good business models, then you can interrogate your business models, meaning you can test out how would our business perform if we were to make such and such a change. And so really, Business models and strategy development are two sides of the same point when you're looking from a strategy rehearsal standpoint. You have a set of strategies, and we hope that they're strategies that move the organization towards sustainability. And you want to know how do those sustainability strategies impact on business? You should, you should be able to determine that with a robust business operating model. You should be able to actually get down to, you know, in my order to cash process. It means X, Y, Z. Okay. So I think it's less around, um, I think quality models, quality business models support better strategic analysis for better strategic adaptation. And it's up to us to make that linkage so that we actually, so that the business, the, the strongly sustainable business model, i.e. if it reflects strong sustainability principles, then when we interrogate it, we'll figure out where is it right and how can we strengthen it. What does that mean for strategic investment and strategic projects and strategic adaptation? And, and is that basic process different from what currently the tens of thousands of people in the conventional business modeling space are doing? Would you say? Well, no, because this is where is we're exactly? you know business modeling has come tradition come out of well, there's two business operating modeling has come out of the enterprise architecture. Um, discipline and, and tradition and is largely based at um, existing operational processes versus 
business modeling on the value proposition side around originating new value propositions, new customer settings, new markets, has come primarily out of the innovation side. The two have yet to be properly integrated. I mean, Osterwalder is our first best. Yes, yes, that's half yes, yes, right? They're now, they've now been integrated. But still, the integration of business modeling with strategy and strategic development and sustain, strategic sustainable development, that connection hasn't been made yet. So we have, to, we have to be able to take, you can't model for the sake of modeling. You model because you're building into a knowledge asset that can be interrogated and tested, and you can test out your strategic options. Any model that can't, doesn't allow you to do that isn't worth the page that's printed on. So, you know, it's not just about getting the model right, it's then about what are all the use cases, to, to, to Christoph's first point here, what are all the use cases in the user's perspective that actually enable us to move forward? Mm. Sorry, I got on a soapbox there. You can't help it. I'm done, done with, thank you for your passion. <laughs> I'm curious if, just to elaborate on that, might be uh, this notion of building in a, uh, a theory of change um, framework to allow the whole thing to fit more uh, fully in a, in a more grounded um, environment where the, the strategic direction is uh, is being set. Amen to that. So, so, so uh, is both what you, you both just said, Doug and Stephen, are, are they examples of the barriers that Christoph has on the slide here, or is this something in addition to or different? No, I think these are the enablers that enable, that make, that make, yeah. that make, uh, enable us to get over these barriers. Mm. We, we've done, I think, I think we've done a terrible job at, at adequately positioning the value of sustainable business model, what it means for strategic adaptation, and embedding it in the strategic adaptation processes in System 4 or BSM, and having senior leadership, i.e. the, you know, the, the executive suite understand why this is great. Yeah. So I think that's the, the communication part, and um, um, I will I have some uh, suggestions or whatever. We'll, we'll try uh, ideas, experiments. We'll try to to do in terms of the communication, um, especially of the value um, that hopefully will be able to overcome or to support overcoming this kind of barrier. I'm, I'm not sure if. Let me just check if there's more. Oh, no, that I think that's that's mainly in terms of the barriers. So, um, I think thanks very much for discussion because I think there's, for me, it was very interesting to hear that there are actually so many more barriers, <laughs> and it's, it's so it's always good to be aware of those. And um, I think um, to be able to find potential solutions around those um, to overcome those. But I don't know if, if you feel that we missed some or if there's anything important um, that, you've, that, that you've experienced, um, why people actually are hesitant to engage um, or why they find it difficult to apply uh, sustainable business model approaches. Did we tackle them all, mention them all? So, so I, I, I think the, the, the design piece, um, the design thinking, the idea that business is primarily a design activity, not an analytical activity, is um, underpins, you know, underpins the idea of testing and iteration. It underpins uh, the idea that you have to learn by doing um, and and we're, we're, we're seeing it now starting to appear quite strongly, for example, in the startup community. Um, but outside of that context in existing businesses, it's, and certainly outside of that context in terms of business schools, it's not being taught or applied at all. Um, and so I, I just, I don't, I don't, I, we, we sort of hinted at that problem, uh, Christoph, but I don't think we, it's been called out in the points that you you've made specifically. Um, and to, to your point, unless you understand the value of a model, right? Um, 
then it's it's really hard. And then and then of course unless you understand the design or a foresight technique like backcasting, yeah. you're unlikely to be able to, which of course is what is missing out of the Silicon Valley startup approaches that they just pivot in the now essentially. Yeah. Um, a long term goal which is based on constraints, enabling constraints, uh, is is very, very hard to do even from a design perspective, right? Because design doesn't necessarily require those sort of system thinking techniques. Hmm. So I, I think I think you've you've hit a lot of great points here, Christopher. I think there's one or two extra that we we're, yeah. we're perhaps pulling out of those that you've identified. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now <laughs> my list of uh, suggestions. Um, actually, how to overcome? We already had some uh, discussion around what could be strategies or ideas. Actually how to overcome those barriers or how to accelerate the use of uh, SSBM approaches in, in practice in general. So the first one, um, it's all about the contextualization. I think it, that's one the very important thing because the increased complexity there and the different and the increased layers of perspective compared to a traditional model there is an increased need for this kind of matching between challenges and solutions. So understanding much better the user perspective is key and also to ability to link to the thinking. And the one size fits all approach, of course it's exaggerated or the holy grail method um, that's not existing. So the holy grail method, I also mean because this in climate kick in the beginning in 2011 and 12, for example, the, the, the business model canvas that also was, was considered to be the holy grail. If you, if you have a great business model canvas, you will be a great startup. So and I don't think uh, it was wrong at that time. <laughs> and I think it definitely is wrong if you think about the uh, sustainability thing as well. So that's why um, the idea, um, and I think Stephen and Anthony probably know that slide from last year, it's already a bit older. Um, so the idea, what we are trying to do at Climate Kick in that sector is that we are trying to broker um, also in the educational space. So we're really in having a deep understanding about the practitioner perspective, the user side, what the discourse is of the, that they're using therein, um, and what the challenges are. And, the, and on, on the other side also being able to understand what are potential concepts and tools and also how they can be used and when they can be used and when they come to the limits in, in different kind of areas. So, because then the kind of matchmaking can happen in between um, and the respective educational concept could be, can be created and the matchmaking between the problems, the challenges. And I'm, I'm just talking about a very broad context because maybe I missed it at the beginning um, to, to, to highlight because we as a clan kick have an extremely broad target group, a very broad mission, more or less tackling all of the society. And therefore, um, for us, this is even more important to be able to understand the different kind of user groups and perspectives because working with uh, city governments, regional governments, national governments, or small SMEs or large corporates, uh, it's completely different in that space. And um, so I think that's one of the, the success factors, what we think from our side to be able to scale is to have this deep understanding of both sides and to be able to match in between. So that's the first kind of uh, strategy. Um, so please, uh, if, if you want to interrupt me or, or so or comment, um, I see there's something going on in the chat. Um, no, it's all it's all just instrumental stuff, Christoph. Keep okay. going. Fine. Okay. Um, yeah. So the second one, very important thing, is I think is the tailored communication, and here it's about working with different stories. Um, also, it's it's related to the context things um, and the perspective thing. Not all of the narratives work for all of the people in all of the situations around uh, strong sustainable business models. And from also the, my, my feeling and also the bit of the experience we had working, there's so, there's so much value in these concepts 
and you can adapt this to so many different things. And so sometimes you can take single pieces out of it, um, like the analytical part around customer, for example, we were discussing before, and describe a good narrative around this. Um, and um, sometimes it's good to, to think about the bigger picture. Sometimes it's important to th think about the implementation part and the validation that you can actually make because of uh, this better kind of model that you're having compared to the traditional ones. So there's different stories are required depending on the use and the way you work with. And actually in most cases, the emphasis needs to be on the value of using such approaches. And um, I know, and I think it will come later in one of my other points, that sometimes it's difficult because um, it's part of this movement. There's a kind of a, a mission behind that um, to, to, to actually share the perspectives on the paradigm shifts and also this normative perspective about paradigm shifts in general. Um, and, uh, and that sometimes people mix up the kind of different kind of perspectives on the communications. And uh, yeah, also to be able to relate on the most important aspects that's linked to the complexity of such models at a specific audience at a given time. And so people can easily relate to them why we are doing this now here and why we're doing this now there and what's kind of a process around it, for example. So um, I, what I can present you is um, kind of, a <laughs> idea about a generic narrative. So we also thought about this a lot about how can we translate the kind of um, stories into good narratives around it and what could be a good narrative. And when you look into the research on business models in general, uh, uh, one of the theme which is popping up there is, uh, or like the hypothesis that uh, is more or less confirmed or discussed by, by, by research, management research and business models, the success or the failure of a company's business model uh, in the future depends largely on how it interacts with other business models and other stakes with and within outside the industry. And uh, if you accept this as a kind of a reality, you have a very strong kind of competitive interest in changing the way how you business model and the way how you design the strategies. So it's not primarily sustainable, but it's integrating a systemic aspect into the business design and business modeling and implementation, which is advisable and brings the competitive advantage. And bringing in the systemic perspective is also the main prerequisite of thinking about the sustainability aspects. That's at least my opinion. So that's, if you take this as a, as a kind of, um, let's say given on if you, if you agree to that, um, there's some, values in strong sustainable business model approaches that just relate to the competitive position of a company. So you're not talking about the normative things and anything. First of all, it's about the innovation opportunities. So you're much better or you enable yourself actually to identify much better what opportunities you have and what risks your business is ex exposed to. Um, and when you do the only customer-centric perspective of, for example, the Osterweiler canvas, you miss a lot of information. And that was, for example, also one of the outcomes of this uh, McDonald's exercise we did. Um, that people were actually able to identify so many business opportunities for McDonald's with new and different stakeholders, or to actually identify new risks that they weren't aware of. And therefore, the business model was wrong, or they actually were doing or making decisions about the business and their strategies based on not being aware of, of, of important factors actually around the business. The second thing is uh, you make informed decisions. Um, because you identify systematically the trade-offs that underlie your strategies and your ideas, and you can make those decisions by uh, inform is okay. I know if I, I need to make a decision on the, at a certain given point, maybe to earn a little bit less, less money, but therefore dramatically limit my bad or negative environmental impact or the other way around. And, um, and that's also not possible if you do just the kind of traditional business modeling. So you make decisions 
unintended with negative effects that you m regret later, maybe. And you think, I would never have done this because it's actually not in line with my values um, and, and the way I wanted to business. And uh, last but not least, probably very important, it enables you to be much more agile, much more resilient as a business. And the risk management part is especially with the established companies, that's the main thing when we talk about climate change. People in the company say, I know climate change is a big risk for my company and for my business model, but I don't know what kind of risk and what it really means for me. And um, to be able to, to have much better kind of um, interpretation of this future and about these kind of things uh, enables you to take action more proactively and to be more agile. So that's part of the narratives that we we'll try to use, especially um, in, in the groups that we work with, established businesses, that not primarily are already convinced about sustainability approaches. This is pro probably a narrative that you don't need to bring forward to for social entrepreneurs, for example, that actually design their business because of doing positive impact for society or achieving it. So, yeah. So that's... Um, just, just, just back on that, that previous slide. Um, I'm, I'm just... Um, that one? No, the previous one. Uh, no, this the next one from that. So 27, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm just trying to find it now, but the, the, the latest book that John Ehrenfeld has contributed to, um, which is all about design for sustainability, um, fascinatingly, the last, uh, it's a contributed edit, edited book, but the last chapter um, is by a Canadian um, philosopher, uh, John Ralston Sol, and he makes the point that um, our language around sustainability has been largely corrupted by management talk, by technical jargon, and we've lost um, our ability to talk authentically um, yeah. about this topic. And uh, I'm just wondering um, whether, and, and I'm not, I'm just thinking out loud here, I'm wondering if there shouldn't be more of a focus on money in the, in, in the three states. If we're trying to appeal generically to people who um, we're assuming understand that something is happening and that they should be concerned for their children and grandchildren, but haven't yet made, managed to make the practical connection to what they're doing in their business, but they do understand money. I, I wonder if we should be talking about that more explicitly. Uh, and I'm sort of partly channeling Bob Willard here as I say this. Um, and the other point I wonder is, um, are you, do you believe we're seeing any evidence that businesses are starting to fail financially uh, because they are not putting these, uh, taking advantage of these or, or doing this thinking that you're suggesting that they need to do? Um, so for, on your first question, definitely I think yes, the money aspect needs to be emphasized or the competitive position aspect. So that's the, the way how you, how you relate to this, uh, also to the traditional ones and how you actually be able to link to those jargon and the way they actually work and talk. Um, on the second part of if, if there's evidence that actually the financial benefits are deteriorating for those, actually it's difficult to say. I, I wouldn't say that there are hard facts because it's, it, we are in a, we live in, in discourses changes and action changes, this inf, uh, discourse influences action all the time. So there, there are many companies now, at least in Europe, um, that are taking action and they spend a lot of money and consultancy time on, 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 on thinking about these kind of things and what it means for the business and they still uh, have difficulties to figuring this out. So, but at the same time, um, you can see at least in some sectors and in some industries that they are taking action. And some of this might be greenwashing, that might not be real action, but they're taking action. And still you can see that there's a, a, a um, deteriorating profit or they lose ground or somehow uh, compared to maybe newly emerging business models in the utility sectors, it's like, for example, like that, or in the, also the, uh, at least in Germany also, um, you can see this happening. But um, 
Yeah, difficult to say. But there, there are a couple of analyses, probably you know them, about where, 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 where actually studies try to um, measure the correlation between um, profits and sustainability efforts. And that you can usually see that there's a high correlation. But the question is, is this because of the, the, the sustainability efforts that, people, that these companies do? Or is it that they just better manage companies because those they are much better thinking about the opportunities and risks and they have identified sustainability um, as one of the core drivers of the businesses in, in whatever way and therefore they are much more proactive and therefore they are much uh, much more um, profitable also. So I, I, I don't know, I don't think that there's really hard evidence on that. But um, you can create narratives around that and at least find some examples and, and also about changing of behavior of companies and CEOs and so on. Um, but difficult to say that a specific um, bankruptcy or whatever is, is related to that. It's similar with climate change. It's like an individual hurricane. It's, you can never link it back to, to, uh, to, to climate change. You just say the likelihood that the uh, number of hurricanes increase will increase with climate change, with the global warming. So probably it's similar to here as well. Let's, yeah, let's see that. Thank you. That's helpful. <clears throat> okay. Um, one of the next kind of suggestions, and that's also one of the things that we've realized. Um, it's very important to make su sustainable business modeling a valuable and inspiring experience given the complexity and so on it's important not to overwhelm people and i think i remember anthony you mentioned in madrid um that um you you used to say uh, to the, the audience that this is much more complex and in madrid you didn't say so and you you realized that actually people were interacting much stronger after that yeah so very small things so i think that's that's very important. So how, what, what actually can people do? Don't overwhelm them, don't put them to too many things. Um, and uh, the debate about the values, personal values, sustainability principles, and so on, it can sometimes be overwhelming. So, and also what's important is demonstrate and highlight successes on the way. Celebrate those with the people. Um, so sometimes it's... Uh, if you integrate sustainability aspects, it's much more difficult to see the direct or the tangible impact of some of these things or decisions they take compared to money or profit that they can measure directly. So that's why it's important that there are some, some other kind of denominators of success that the people can celebrate and um, make it a fun experience, of course. It's also very important. Um, and in general, that's... Um, not, not only linked to a sustainability, the, the experience is so important because um, in general, people that are resistant to change, um, they cannot imagine how it would be to, to, different, to do things differently or how it would be differently. And experience, experiencing the change um, and the benefits of this change is therefore one of the most powerful, actually, um, tools that you can use. So, for example, to give you an example from a different context, um, in Frankfurt, um, there's a river going through the city, and there used to be parking lots next to those 10 years ago, the length of the river. And the, the city decided to remove the parking space and make green area, green space, a park area for the people. And actually, more than 50% of the citizens said, we are crazy, we don't want this, we need those parking spaces. Um, and then they did it anyway. And uh, then I think a couple of years later, they asked again the people if they want to have back their parking lot. And 99% of, of this population said, are you crazy? We are just loving this area. And um, so you can, this is a different example, this experiencing the difference and the change is very important. And I think also in that sense, it's important to highlight those experiences and this positive experience. And of course, it's difficult to say how, in a longer process, how you can actually do that. But um, if you have ideas or suggestions how to make this a more valuable and successful experience as such, um, I, I would be very happy to hear about the suggestions. Um, 
Christoph, we're, we're approaching six o'clock, uh, uh, okay. which, which is midnight your time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you're, you're doing a great job uh, being very animated at such a late hour, which we're very appreciative of. Um, perhaps, uh, I, I know you could probably keep going based on, I see you're bringing up a, a, a new point, but perhaps uh, think about closing it over the next uh, few minutes. Would be yes, a, okay, I'll do that. So actually, um, of course, the kind of suggestions that I, that I have here, ideas and strategies are on different levels. Yeah, so the ones that I mentioned so far are mainly about also communication and how to work around these approaches, and now also some about how we can engage in the debates and in the thought leadership um, around it, so that to promote, um, uh, to lay the ground actually around those models. And um, I think also here we need to talk much more about positive examples of corporates that did this, um, well-known examples at best, and of course, different examples. And if you have created those, share those and, 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 and do that. Um, but also be able to relate to your audience with the examples and cases that you have. And uh, if you have a, an inspiring startup in a different, in a certain sector, uh, sometimes it's not an appropriate example to use working with an SME in, in the paper industry, or whatever, for example. And uh, yeah, engage in thought leadership debate and shape the discourse. And that's um, on many levels. Yeah, not only in sustainability communities, but also out there where in, in discourses where it might not be comfortable to engage because people have different opinions um, or have different perceptions. It's very important to engage there as well with the, with the people that follow the more like the traditional perspective on business and actually trying to defend. And especially looking at some of how the high-level political debates and discourses are shaping, you can see that it's getting maybe even more and more important, uh, at least in some parts of the world, to engage here in that, in that area. <clears throat> um, yeah, one of the things I think personally is also important if you work in that area, sometimes it's good not to put your personal interest at the forefront, but think about secondary effects that are already valuable. Normative approaches very often um, actually don't work. Um, because it's also the nature of people that if you tell people how to do things or how they should behave, it's a kind of a natural reaction to say, stop first. Um, and that's why um, you should use this only in, in, in kind of when people share values and paradigms. But you need to work with other people as well if you want to scale. So therefore, Choose the entry point in the discussion um, according to the people. Be sometimes maybe a bit more cautious. Use a Trojan horse approach. And that can work. And that's also, we, we did this in a couple of workshops as well, where we worked with traditional, more conservative businesses. Um, yeah, and then creating the capacities and multipliers. Yeah, try to help people... Um, to, to, to scale, to use, multiply, train others. And if you need to prioritize, then work with those people that you think that they really will apply um, and create the demonstrator examples. And I think one more that's more linked to uh, what we still can do as a community is, of course, co-create, share, and learn. I think this group is a best example of that, bringing together more than 1,000 people interested in this topic to to discuss. And I think there's a lot of more work coming up on the research side, on the practitioner application, on communication. And um, therefore, it's important to do that and to engage. And um, yeah, also to learn, of course, very important. And to question your own approaches and widen the portfolio of, um, of ideas and thoughts. Given that time is over and we've discussed already, I think probably we'll skip that. <laughs> uh, unless you, there's maybe one important thing or one very important suggestion or experience you made, I think that definitely would be very helpful. Um, if not... Chris, Christoph, that might be a, a great uh, uh, topic to try and start in the LinkedIn group. If, if you'd like to post that yes. uh, as, a, as a question, um, then we can take that, uh, take that conversation to the wider uh, group who have not been able to be here and, and the, the folks here to be able to contribute. Yes, okay. So yeah, then the, just, just would like to close then with, um, with an invitation. I think some of, of we've 
uh, we as Clam Hip work already with some of you, but I would like to uh, invite everyone to, to contact me or us as an organization. And um, if you're interested in this topic, in, uh, especially you know, around education concepts, uh, e-learning materials, creating them um, also, about case studies and examples, if you have them to share or if you want some to use, uh, tools, methods, and much more. Yeah, so um, please feel free to contact me at any time. Um, and yeah, and we're trying to do our best as an organization also to, to support the movement and to contribute to the multiplying and scaling of strongly sustainable business model approaches. And, and I just want to, uh, to, 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 first of all, Crystal, thank you for that uh, invitation and indeed uh, for coming today and, and presenting. And I just have my, my personal reflection that uh, Christoph makes this uh, offer generously and in uh, good spirit and that we have had very good experiences uh, on many of these topics already and with more to come in a number of the pieces of work that we've been doing. So uh, he's not making this invitation lightly or anything of that nature. It's, it's serious and genuine. And so I, I encourage people to take uh, Christoph up on that. Okay. Um, any other closing thoughts, Christoph? And then I'll, I'll just wrap up. Um, just one, uh, another thing, if, because next, you know, in two weeks, we have a big event, a global event, a climathon, and it might even be in, last time it was in Toronto, it might even be in Toronto as well. So uh, if you want to engage uh, on a short term and see some of the things we're doing, this might be an, an opportunity. So this is the infographic from last year. This year we have more than 100 cities joining and trying to find business models to sustainability challenges, mainly climate change related challenges in cities. Um, 24 hours, people are coming together and trying to hack and identify ideas at the same time in more than 100 cities. Um, if you are not able to attend one of those, um, you can also follow that on, on social media and, and so on. It's very, very, um, for us, it's a very important, inspiring event. And um, yeah, it created already a movement. So two years ago, we started with 30 cities, last year 60, and this year more than 100. Um, yeah, so feel free to, to follow up on that as well. So yeah, I think that's it from my side. And thank you very much again, Anthony, and to the, to the group for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to share some of our experiences and um, also for your contributions and ideas and the discussion. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. That's been fantastic. Um, so uh, the, the recording takes about half an hour to process, but it will be posted uh, on the LinkedIn group along with the link to the slides that Christoph has been using uh, very shortly. Uh, and uh, I, just a final reminder, the 65th monthly meeting uh, of this group will be next uh, uh, month, the, or as usual, the second Tuesday of each month at the same time, so that's November the 14th, and our presenter will be Randy Saad, who's been on the call today, uh, who's going to be giving us uh, an update on the Refocus project, uh, which obviously is focused on the program management of the transformation uh, processes required. Uh, program design and, and management of the processes required for organizations to actually do the projects to implement the new business models that they have defined. So another important aspect of our work. So thank you everybody. I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, this time next month. Uh, Stephen Davies will be here in Toronto facilitating. I will be elsewhere, but hopefully on the, on the meeting. And uh, look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. And a good day for uh, actually Morris, who's in uh, the Philippines. His day is just starting. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.